Okay, well, thank you, Chris. I'd like to thank also the organizers of this event for this very forward-thinking idea that we're here um, jointly to discuss. Uh, for the next 50 minutes, we will consider advances in artificial intelligence um, and the radical advances and maturity of the Chinese healthcare system and discreetly that intersection. We're joined by five great leaders who work at the intersection of computer science, um, healthcare, medicine, um, and commerce. Uh, I'm just back from Pudong, uh, uh, visiting our Chinese uh, research center there. It's always a very energizing trip. Things are moving so fast. I'm therefore very well calibrated to the growth and momentum of, and innovation potential in China. With respect to healthcare in China, um, we see a very unique confluence of emerging trends. It's the second largest market for healthcare. It's exhibiting 7 to 18 percent growth year on year. It is increasing and opening access to innovative medicines. There's heavy investment in STEM education with 2.6 million, I should say 4.7 million uh, recent STEM graduates and 17 billion dollars in venture investment in 2018, more than 700 companies. Um, further, the radical growth um, and build in Chinese healthcare is happening in a very modern moment where computer science and um, artificial intelligence are now increasingly mainstream. But there are many questions, many questions for this panel to consider. Some are unique to China, but I think that you'll find, we'll find, that many of them are quite general around quality of care, delivery at scale, um, implications of a single payer and an emerging private um, payer system, data ownership, access, and, and, and. Um, it's going to be an exciting conversation. I'd ask our panelists to please introduce yourself and your organization, and then we'll double click and go deeper. Thanks, Jay, and uh, thanks to the WIFM for the invitation. I think this is a very exciting topic, and largely because um, as G Healthcare, I'm the Chief Innovation Officer. China represents one of the most technologically innovative places to be, and particularly, I would say, in, when it comes to healthcare. So I think that's a, a place that we're looking at in the, in the way we work with five centers, more than 7,000 employees, more than 16, uh, 160,000 install-based devices, which are giving us a lot of information. So it's a real pleasure to be here, and I think this is one of the most exciting places to, uh, to do innovation in the, in the intersections, as you said, of data and science. Thank you very much, Jay. So I'm CK, the founder and CEO of InfoVision. We basically applied the technology of deep learning in the field of medical imaging in China. So a brief introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jay. Uh, it's my honor to be here. And uh, uh, my name is Jay from Zhejiang University. I'm a full professor there. And also, I have a company, uh, Real Doctor. And we do the same thing with Quan. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Ru Jing, uh, the founder of Edu Cloud. Uh, we, ov over the past six years, we invested uh, more than 100 million US dollars developing a technology called a DPAP platform. So basically making uh, data from all different healthcare IT system within the medical institution to usable patient-centered traceable data and that can be ap applied to research and clinical services as well as uh, uh, patient management. Um, hi, my name is uh, Nisa, Nisa Leung. I'm a managing partner of uh, Chiming Ventures. Sorry, I kind of lost my voice on the way to uh, Boston. Um, we, uh, we manage 4.3 billion US dollars, uh, pretty much 100% focused on investing in China, 50% uh, in tech, and 50% uh, in healthcare. Uh, so I lead the healthcare investment. Uh, we've invested in about 310 companies so far, about 70 some IPOs and M&As. We've had uh, 13 IPOs in the last two years. And um, we're also one of the most um, active investors in AI uh, technology, including Face++, uh, Robotic, the largest robotic company, the largest chatbot, uh, the, um, you know, the largest autonomous driving company, and voice recognition and so forth. So it's great to, uh, to be on this panel, and thank you so much, Jay. All right, well, thank you all. And as you can see, an esteemed, experienced, uh, and leading um, group here. Um, CK, let's start with you. 
uh, it's quite remarkable. Your company, InfraVision, is four years old, already works with 200 hospitals or healthcare systems, and is truly at the bleeding edge of the application of artificial intelligence and image analysis. And um, I'm just interested to know um, what it's been like growing such a business, and specifically as we have many clinicians here, what is the cultural, the early learnings about cultural adoption from doctors receiving now this type of artificial guidance? Yeah. So when we first started the company, uh, we say that no matter how advanced the AI technology is, the adoption of the technology must come from a actual demand from the clinical setting. So when we look at the uh, medical industry in China, for the past 10 years, we see that the government, uh, the Chinese government, wants to adopt a uh, hierarchical medical system in which like, the primary level hospitals and the clin clin clinics should be able to do the initial screening, should be able to, do, to absorb the initial demand of the uh, med medical service. And then like, with specialized or even more serious problems, then we actually go up to the top or more specialized hospitals. But then the actual challenge faced with this current system is that uh, China has such a huge population with so limited number of qualified, trained doctors. So what happens is that uh, in, in, in the medical sphere, we actually see that the real challenge is that for early symptom detection and early symptom diagnosis, it's actually not easier to do that, but it's actually much harder to come up with early symptom detection. So, so the paradox is that the best hospital, uh, the best physicians are actually in the top hospitals in the higher level. And then they're not willing to actually go down to the primary level, to the remote areas to do the initial screening. And also it's kind of like a waste if they actually do that because like probably at, at the primary level, 95% of the patients probably doesn't have much going on. So this actually creates a challenge with the hierarchical medical system that we, the Chinese government would want to uh, implement or maybe we as a society would want to see. So here's the challenge, but we see that with the advent of artificial intelligence, when we learn enough data, when we actually precipitate the skills and the techniques of the best doctors from the top hospitals, we might be able to actually provide the expertise for the rural areas, for the remote areas, for the smaller hospitals, so that they will, ab they will be able to do the, the initial screening, the detection, at a much lower cost, but also at a much higher quality. So I, we think that this is actually the demand that we see when we first enter the field, and that's actually the, the problem that we started to tackle initially. So uh, after four years of development, we think that um, we're actually getting closer, although it's still a long way to go, we're getting closer to uh, alleviating this problem. We see that, for example, I don't want to go into unsubstantiated clinical claims where we're still doing a lot of testing, but at least in some of the cases that we test and we work with, uh, some of the hospitals, we see that, for example, for lung cancer, with the adoption of artificial intelligence, we can potentially reduce the incidence of very costly and expensive lung cancer by 78%. Uh, while for like, metastatic lung cancer, it's actually 53% reduction rate, potentially, with the adoption of AI. So that's actually the problem that we see in China, and that's actually the potential we see when we actually adopt like, the technology of artificial intelligence in uh, China, which is a very special like, uh, situation in the world. Yeah. And is the, are the electronic medical record systems, is the, the infrastructure, the highways, the wires, um, the bricks and mortar in place to receive this throughout the entire country, or is that also growing in parallel to all that, that you've done? Yes, I think like um, in the past like 15 to 10, 20 years, we see that the Chinese hospitals has been adopting like electronic records, which is actually the basis of doing all the AI, including training as well as deployment. So I think with this in place, and we can actually uh, adopt AI very quickly today. But I think another side of the story is that actually doctors and physicians in China, they're actually very used to seeing new technologies. And that's why they can actually adopt and accept this new technology very fast. So when we look at the adoption of artificial intelligence with the physicians, we actually observe a very interesting curve, which we say that is the adoption curve of radiologists 
for AI. So initially, we see a valley of indifference in which they were thinking that, well, this is just a boring technology, or maybe they will feel threatened that, well, it's coming to replace me, maybe, and they're not going to use it. So it's actually a valley. But then, like, once they start trying to use the artificial intelligence, they, they click it, they use it a bit, they think, wow, this is actually not coming to replace me. It's a good tool to assist me. And then they will actually have higher and higher expectation of the technology, and then we actually enter into a peak of over-enthusiasm, in which they will think that AI can do a lot for them. But this is actually a period that is the most headache for AI providers like us, because like the provide the physicians who think that, well, you have a lot of complaints saying that, well, your AI is supposed to do this, but it's not, it cannot yet. And you should, your AI should be able to do that, but you cannot yet. And so we'll receive a lot of complaints in this period, and then we actually drop down to a valley of disappointment. <laughs> but, then, but then after that, you will have a mutual accept acceptance. So it's kind of like they will know what AI can do. They will also know what AI cannot do. So in the process, they will accept AI as it is, as a good tool to assist them in some of the situation, but it's not going to help them much in others. And then they will actually use it more fluently. So we actually see a very interesting adoption curve like when the physicians and radiologists use this technology. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's not dissimilar to what we see in chemistry. The chemists are always asking, is, are AI and the robots coming to replace me? And I say, no, but the chemist with AI will replace the chemist <laughs> without it. Yeah, yeah. Um, you describe this hype cycle, and Nisa, I'm wondering if we could ask you to comment expertly um, with examples, if possible, around what you see emerging out of the exit vector that CK describes as the meaningful application, the critical use cases. There is a lot of hype with respect to AI. Um, already some penetration into real world medical practice, but you know, funding more than 300 companies in AD and healthcare, um, you must see a lot of hype. Yeah. What comes out the other side? Um, I guess that uh, our comp on top of our data um, infrastructure, the one of the first application that we developed was uh, uh, enabled research practices for scientists and, the, and the physicians. Um, we believe that uh, the current system requires every scientist and the physicians spends a lot of time and money to do uh, historical uh, studies. So with our system then the, and our AI technologies, we can basically, you know, help the physicians to have top view and, uh, and deploy algorithms and the criteria of, uh, of uh, the kind of research they want to do onto our system. And uh, both learning what happens historically in the real world and also follow those patients and tracking them uh, in a much cheaper and more efficient manner. So, so this is uh, one of the first applications that we started um, on our platform. And the second one that we see uh, you know, quite, deep, uh, that quite popular is uh, uh, like what CK is trying to do on clinical decision support system. And uh, so for each, and, uh, uh, for each of the disease, we develop uh, uh, things like timeline that uh, helps uh, the doctor to have a top view of uh, uh, certain patients for the past uh, 10 or 15 years that the, the machine helps to formulate the key criteria that needs, the doctor needs to be focused on. So the physician can, can actually understand the, the particular characteristic of that patient in a second, uh, rather than, you know, like what they did before, going into the files and the learning and reading a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, unstructured text. So with our medical brain, then uh, the machine can read it for them and, uh, and, uh, and highlight the, 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 the past historical experiences of uh, these certain patients to, to the physician. And, uh, and the second thing we have is that we are on our system for each and the certain treatments that the physician choose, the, the machine can help to calculate on a real world, real world data sets the possibility of certain treatments outcome or the choices of medicine or choices, choices of, uh, of, uh, for that particular 
patient or with similar patient's uh, uh, profile. So, you know, on these two fronts that we, we find it that the, 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 uh, quite popular within the physicians and the scientists. And uh, of course, there are many, many other applications that's being developed on top of uh, our data infrastructure, like how we work with the CFDA, um, actively uh, using algorithm to monitor the, the outcomes of certain drugs uh, across 22 provinces and how we, we work with the uh, Medicare system to quickly evaluate uh, the eco economy uh, of a certain drug or certain treatment and certain behavior. But those research can be done by, by, by our system uh, much cheaper and much faster. It may not be the most accurate, but it, it gives a perspective, uh, a quick perspective to the researchers and the, and the scientists. Now, in, in your organization, you're working with many of the largest hospitals, maybe as many as two-thirds of them, and we have seen um, in smaller studies of integrated data analyses the way garbage in causes garbage out. And um, your organization has made a major financial investment in rendering medical record level data as machine learnable. Could you describe the scope of this investment and the essentiality, the learnings okay. of having done this? Sure. Um, it's good that I'm not, uh, I'm not, I didn't do, I didn't study medicine. So uh, I think that's part of the reason why um, we made this daring investment. So I'm glad that uh, I made this investment. Um, just to uh, to clarify, we we serve about 80 to 90 uh, of the top 150 hospitals uh, yeah, in China, and uh, the reason that we chose those uh, those uh, partners uh, of hospitals to work with beca is because they represent sometimes the highest quality of medical practices uh, of China. And, uh, and of certain physicians. So that has, uh, to, for the entry point, that has helped us, or our medical brain, to eliminate a lot of uh, so-called crap in and crap out. <laughs> <laughs> Right. And the second thing is that we, out of our 850 employees, we have 200 uh, top physicians and doctors that just basically helping to uh, read through what the machine has processed. So as part of our data application processing platform, um, you know, which includes integration, processing, security, uh, storage, transfer, etc. And the very, very important function is correcting the right putting correcting the right information or sending what we call the crap EMR back to the hospitals and ask them, see, okay, do you want to reveal that again? And uh, is there anything we should uh, work on? And do we re need to change something and re put it back into the system? So what we call quality improvement, that's one of the services that we provide for the medical institutions that we work with. So, so far that uh, I think that uh, we, we, I think the general, uh, the general consensus uh, is always say, you know, uh, crap in, crap out, but, but just with our experience, you know, six years on, and uh, we, have, uh, we have published uh, 40 uh, the paper in, uh, in, 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 in magazines like Cancer and uh, Natural Science, uh, natural, science natural Medicine, and, uh, and uh, Lancet, and, uh, and JAMA. So, so, and also we're working with, uh, with uh, you know, 10 top biotech companies on first class uh, drugs. And uh, we also um, we also have uh, found many many correlations that uh, that uh, you know human uh, or physicians have not found before. And uh, and uh, so there are a lot of stuff that we have uh, we have uh, we have accumulated that we found will be making huge improvements to the to the general healthcare industry. So um, so yes, um, I think that uh, it was a very difficult journey, but I am glad that we did it. 
Well, the data standards um, with medical records and also the better leverage of high quality medical imaging data are important first forays into AI enabled healthcare. Nisa, um, you must see a lot of great ideas pitched. Um, and I can only imagine what gets through the gauntlet. As you think about AI and the provision of healthcare in clinics and in hospitals, what, what have you seen that's exciting in China? So I think, you know, um, if we can take a step back, um, you know, the China fundraising um, investment into AI healthcare last year was over a billion dollars. Um, this is about two thirds um, compared to um, the global, of the global fundraising in AI healthcare, at least according to some data. Um, and about um, 70 deals were funded. And uh, prior to that, we've also seen hundreds of uh, mobile health companies uh, funded uh, in the last three, four years, and some of them going into AI since it was a little bit difficult for them to find a business model thereafter. Um, so what we are seeing right now is there are actually multiple, in, in general, uh, we've seen most of the AI healthcare companies, and I would say that most of them um, ex exaggerate a little bit too much what they can achieve, um, and, um, and then everybody actually converges to the same idea, um, either you know, imaging or you know, data, patient data uh, for cancer care or for you know, um, or home use and other things. And, I mean, you know, if everybody converges into the same ideas. But for us, it's all about execution. It's all about um, the team's uh, capability to really build out. So there's actually a lot of um, fluff going on right now in the AI sector. And so what we're also seeing is the AI um, companies as a whole, not only in healthcare, but the valuations have dropped 30% or so, um, except with the exception of some of the leading companies in this area. So, um, so imaging, um, I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's an area, and we're very fortunate to have invested in CK's company early on. Um, so uh, imaging is, uh, is an area where I think China will play an, a very important role. Um, and I think you know, another company that we've also been very early on investment is We Doctor, uh, which Jen is uh, involved with, and he'll tell you more. But one thing I want to highlight about We Doctor is you know, this is an example where you see China leapfrogging the world. Mm -hmm. um, when about four years ago, and this is told to me by one of the Zhejiang uh, province provincial um, head of science and technology, that um, the CEO of We Doctor went to him one day and said, can you give me an internet hospital license? And you know, the official said, what is that? And, and then later on, he said, OK, why don't I talk to my colleagues? And, um, and then you know, some time later, he, they gave uh, this company the first internet hospital license in China and probably the world. And you know, if you look at it now, um, uh, three years later, they have 13, 14 licenses or more now. But they are seeing over 90,000 patients a day through the internet hospital. And there's also AI involved in their other business units as well, as well as the internet hospital. And I'm sure Jen will talk, tell you about. So that's something that makes a huge difference. Because you know what? For the last 20 years, the Chinese government has been trying to educate the rural doctors. But it's very difficult, because once you teach them, once you educate them on, in GP, you can't really get them educated in specialty. So how do you treat or you know, cater to the um, population in the rural areas? So that's where internet uh, can really play a role. And, um, and then, of course, you know, AI as well. And, um, and then you know, we talked about also EMR. One of our companies is the leading EMR company in China. Um, they've uh, already provided the EMR system to over 1,200 hospitals, the top hospitals in, in China. And about a year and a half ago, Alibaba invested in them. Uh, also wanting to do consumer uh, EMR as well, um, but they've also been building cloud EMR for um, a lot of the leading hospitals. And I think, um, you know, they're so right about, um, you know, having good data generating um, to create reports, um, you know, with the good data for us. Because right now I see most of the companies um, that claim to have good data actually has very fragmented data that it's very hard for doctors and hospitals to actually make use of for drug discovery. And another one of our companies is the leading clinical CRO, the Quintiles of China. Um, so we're the only investor of the company before they went public. It's about four or five billion dollar market cap company now. 
And um, so we are involved with a lot of um, new drug discovery programs, um, as well as um, uh, um, you know, investing in a lot of uh, these particular areas in, in various different areas as well, including you know, CRISPR, you know, UCAR-T, uh, and so forth. But I think that uh, one of the things that we also uh, are looking actively is, and one of the reasons we, you know, is uh, AI and drug discovery. So uh, we are um, an investor in Schrodinger, and uh, we also invested in, in a couple of uh, AI drug discovery companies uh, in China um, that we believe will help um, spearhead or even um, make faster and more accurate, cheaper drug discovery um, out of China. And I think one of the things that we're seeing, and, and it's really interesting about last week, I think one of the uh, US FDA uh, officials said that, why don't we get some of the cheap PD-1s uh, from China to US? And I think one of the things that we're seeing is um, there are over 150 PD-1 programs happening right now in clinical trial in China. And it, it is going to be cheap because by the time, assuming half of them get approved, uh, the medical reimbursement they're going to get is going to be so cheap uh, compared to what's happening in US. And that's also something else that is a huge difference between US and China, is once you get a drug into medical reimbursement in China, the, that cost the pricing comes down every year uh, versus in US, a lot of times the pricing goes up. So I think that's also something that we're also seeing where AI and drug discovery um, would be making a difference. Um, so I think this is some of the examples. Thanks. Brilliant, Nisa, thank you. Terry, you have an interesting angle on all this. Mm -hmm. Recently relocated to Boston, by the way. Um, welcome. GE's been in China for years. GE Healthcare, as we just heard from your introduction, 160,000 instruments. I can't even imagine the imaging and medical data that that um, infrastructure can generate every year. Is the Chinese healthcare system ready to process data at that scale and to deliver quality health care at that scale. What opportunities do you see in China? Well, there's really, a, there's lots of things that we're doing. And, and as I said, it's, it's one of the most important technology innovation centers for, for us, and not just for the purposes of what that means in the context of China's healthcare system, but actually to, to kind of this reverse innovation model, which is it's being able to generate things um, that we're using in other parts of the world. But two main areas that are, you know, deeply related to how do you use the data. One is around how do you make better use of the existing infrastructure? You know, how do you make the systems run more efficiently? How do we make our instruments, um, you know, produce more uh, capable uh, output? How do more patients get through those systems? So a lot of our analytics related to that is just how do we make these instruments perform at, you know, a, a higher throughput or to a, a greater degree better uh, answers are quicker to the answer. Um, and lots of good examples of, of us working on that for um, whether it's in car cardiology or in, in uh, oncology or such. The other is what was already mentioned, and that is the, the challenge of how do you get healthcare out into the rural uh, model. And um, as, as CK was saying, there's you know a, a paucity of, of resources, of trained resources to do that. Um, and so this virtual capability, can I embed in the devices the intelligence to do this? Can I support that system vis-a-vis -vis um, you know, a chat bot or a remote you know, expert? And one example of that is we, we worked with the Society of OBGYNs in China and said, listen, we're, can we make the ultrasound machine to do prenatal scanning um, you know, basically uh, perform at the same level that you have, which, you know, would be at the highest degrees in Shanghai or Beijing and such. So we worked with the data, we worked with the clinicians, um, and we developed an algorithm that now someone can scan, and it gets, you know, it gets back the information that you need to understand whether this person, does it have a healthy, does it, you know, what's the gestational age, is there reasons to have this person, um, you know, elevated to a, no, a more acute setting to give delivery. All these things are kind of embedded in that. And then a quality control method that's running in the background to ensure that you know someone doesn't stray off course in, in the way that uh, they're using this. And we know ultrasound is um, already very variable, so it's a, it's, it's a tool that actually is going to have, I think, profound use across other markets as well. So those are two examples. Um, 
The other thing that I think is fascinating is the amount of data in China. And we are, um, as we take uh, model development and we're looking at these federated learning models, it's very clear that the differences within populations, um, as well as the differences in the way things happen in the health delivery systems, uh, really is important because the biases that are built in based on where you do your model development is, is certainly there. And we see this almost every single time. We see algorithms that are developed in one place taken to another place don't always work the same way. And I think it's important. So that variety of data and the veracity of the data is really critical for AI development. Um, the one other thing I would say is you know, the, the way in which healthcare um, conventionally is done there's an estimated five billion-ish people in the world who lack access to quality care. And even if today we took all the money and all the people that it took to do that, it still would be very hard to solve that problem. Mm -hmm. And that's what's so exciting about these types of developments for which you can um, not take the conventional approach. And so I think where, where the infrastructure doesn't exist is actually in some ways easier because you don't have to unwind something in order to bring something new. And, and you know, I think Nisa mentioned it's already leapfrogging in, in China. And I think that um, that really makes us super interested in what's happening. How do we participate in that? And um, as I said, we have 7,000 people now in healthcare working you know, uh, together with, with the uh, provider community and the, and the government as well on, well, what does that mean? How can we take advantage of the fact there's not enough infrastructure? Well, that just encourages you to be more innovative. Um, and so. Um, we, we find ourselves with you know, long lists of things that can happen that might be really hard to happen in, say, in the US, for example, or in Europe. Oh, thank you. Jin, Real Doctor um, Corporation is about two years old and um, sitting in an academic environment and spinning out this uh, ambitious company. I'm very curious, I'm sure all would be, to know what the experience has been um, starting a business around AI at the intersection of retinopathy and medical imaging. Um, and what are the, the early signs from your company um, about what it will be like to empower healthcare practitioners with this technology? Uh, uh, first, uh, I'm a, a professor in Zhejiang University. Uh, we're doing the AI research uh, beginning from 1978. and. Uh, we have hammers on the hand and we have to find something to crack. So uh, the medical image is the first thing we found. Uh, first, we looking into the founders. Uh, in these pictures, images, we can find uh, maybe 12 uh, major disease from the founders' pictures. Then uh, we collect lots of data, and then build the model, then uh, implement in top hospitals in China. And then uh, we expand this research to other uh, fields, uh, such like uh, long nodule. We find uh, small nodules, uh, doctors may be uh, missed. Uh, and we help the doctors to predict uh, whether the patients can live longer or not uh, in pancreatic cancers uh, for one year, for two years, or three years from the data they collect from EMR, such as uh, BMI, whether he drink or not, uh, smoke, uh, and the, the uh, CA199, uh, CEA, uh, all these data, we uh, predict the live uh, period. And then uh, after that, uh, some uh, investments uh, came to us and asked whether you can uh, implement all these things uh, into hospitals. Uh, we, uh, you can uh, get a, a startup companies. Then uh, we uh, right now, we have 50 uh, uh, colleagues and uh, uh, students in the companies, and uh, uh, we collaborate with uh, 100 hospitals and uh, implement 
uh, seven uh, products into their hospitals and uh, waiting for the CFDA clearance. You see, uh, in China, the CFDA um, has no standard procedures to uh, get a clearance in AI. So uh, we are still working on that. Thank you. Thank you. And Jin and CK, I wonder if I could ask you, medical imaging is such a natural first uh, area to deploy AI. Um, you know, a, um, a car with artificial intelligence, I'm very grateful that the Tesla won't hit me on my bicycle in Cambridge. <laughs> um, so efficient is the processing of image-based data. So much of healthcare is not image-based. Where will AI go next after imaging in routine um, healthcare practice? Uh, so basically, there are a lot of talk. There has been a lot of talk about using artificial intelligence in medical imaging for the past few years, and it's starting to, to become a boring topic to talk about medical imaging and deep learning. But I think at the same time, it's easy to forget that sometimes the real challenge doesn't come from running an algorithm, running a model, and derive a very good result from a limited set of data. But the actual challenge sometimes actually come from once I have a model, can I actually deploy it in real settings? Can I actually have a robust and stable model in which, just like Terry said, can be applied across different regions? So even a very simple application, like for example, lung nodule detection in medical imaging, it actually took us almost like four years to mature this particular product or particular model, which we still think that there's still much work to be done in this area itself. So we think that actually a lot of work needs to be done uh, in, in order for a model to actually reach the stage in which it's not no longer a research project, but actually a safe and efficient uh, product which can be applied across different regions. So we, we think that there's still a lot of work to be done, but at the same time, if we actually look forward, we will think that definitely medical imaging is just only one step of the entire clinical pathway. And in itself, it's not going to create any value for the patients. So when we actually look at the pathway of the clinical setting, we see that well, maybe the first step is detection. Uh, maybe the, next, the second step is diagnosis from the detection. Maybe from then on, it's actually the uh, treatment like coming out of the diagnosis itself. So I think these are actually the pathway in which we might be able to use artificial intelligence one by one to actually make it more efficient. But I think it's going to take a lot of time and it's going to take a lot of different teams coming into this area. And I think we're going to see development for the next decades or maybe even the next centuries. So I think this is the exciting part and also the part in which we need to have a lot of patience and persistence. Jin, Terry, do you see additional applications in the near term beyond medical imaging? Ab absolutely. Um, I mean, we work with CT CK's company as well, and I think it's a great example of someone that thinks very pragmatically. That's not just about the algorithm, but it's actually how do you make the impact? How do you get people's behaviors? Um, how does it work, you know, kind of frictionless in the system so that it's there naturally in the workflow? But um, one or two areas that we are working on that I think are really exciting as well is uh, one is on sepsis because of the, you know, the the real issue with sepsis is it's, it's not that we don't know how to detect it, it's just we detect it too late. And it's, uh, so connecting all these pieces of the, the data exhaust, if you will, that's coming off this patient, um, and including with things like you know, the facial recognition, because one of the other correlative factors is in fact, the, once you study this, the patient's face starts to change as they become you know, increasingly more septic. So it's not one that we would have said, you know, it's not the, the, the oxygen concentration, it's not the temperature, it's not. But it's actually interesting to see bringing all these pieces together and then in an algorithmic model, determining can we be, you know, first descriptive, then predictive, um, and, and all obviously down to the, uh, out to the point of being prescriptive. Um, we were already moving this meter, you know, from being able to um, detect it to now being able to predict it. And I think at some point, the, you know, these algorithms will become prescriptive um, based on you know, the, the body of evidence that's there. And then how do you coordinate that care within all the stakeholders that are involved in the case of a, you know intensive care or a septus uh, condition? 
And that to me has been probably more eye-opening. It's as much effort to figure that part out as it is to come up with a, you know, a, a battle-tested, robust algorithm. It's, so what? You know, if no one's really paying attention to it, then I didn't really change anything. So um, I think the whole science around that is really uh, important. We're doing a very similar type of work around um, just the subset of oncology around the tumor board. You know, what, what makes for good decision-making with all these you know, specialists that sit around the table? And how do you make that process more evidence-driven? How do you make that process more efficient? Um, and I think, again, these are combinations of algorithms, but also this kind of frictionless workflow that brings together the right people so that the patient gets a better outcome. I mean, that's fascinating. I love this idea of anticipatory diagnostics from unexpected places and facial recognition of the patient in an ICU setting. That's very, very curious. Mm. I, my experience on the stem cell transplant wards is the first face that changes is the nurses. And uh, maybe if we could detect that, you'd really follow their lead, never wrong. Um, Regine, I have a question for you that comes from the audience, if that's okay. okay. Uh, the Chinese government has driven the healthcare industry and its development. So how do we approach personal data privacy? Um, you are stockpiling millions of medical records, perhaps even billions, um, curating, re-curating these data into a common language that's machine learnable and can be integrated with other data sources. What is the state of data privacy considerations, constraints, and consents in China today? Yeah. Um, I I think that uh, the Chinese government, uh, the data privacy is uh, one of the hottest topic within the within the different bodies of the of the government. And being the top companies in this field, we proactively work with uh, uh, academic communities as well as uh, uh, the legal uh, representatives of uh, of uh, the regulatory bodies uh, to help to uh, to to improve uh, the 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 regulation regulation environment uh, for for our industry um, because it's also to our benefit that uh, to have a more stable and uh, predictable uh, regulatory environment so for now uh, with our practices we 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 you, we completely comply to uh, HIPAA which is uh, which is the, the American standard. So the raw data stays within the uh, within the, the the hospital, and uh, the patients give consents for for certain research. And if we do uh, do clinical research or uh, certain practices that link that for those use, use cases that needs personal identification, we would need to get a personal consent for, 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 the, for those usage. But for things that are epidemic, epidemic and population studies, which uh, does not involve uh, in uh, identif uh, personal identification, then we, we don't need to have consent for that. And uh, also on top of our system, we have, uh, because a range of uh, different roles are using our system. And so we have a passport level uh, within our system. So if your doctor is looking at your profile for your, for, for, to cure you, to, 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 to cure your disease, then he, of course he needs to have consent in our system to access your personal data for the, for, for the past um, for, for, the, uh, for, the, for the past few years to, to better understand what's going on. But, and also, uh, if someone within the department is doing, uh, you know, department management or uh, or research that need that that improve their medical clinical practices within that hospital departments, and that also give them the uh, uh, complying to the law. They also give them the the same kind of uh, uh, security access as well. But for other use cases, uh, it, you know, you you still need to have a, a different clearance level according to the, uh, according to the uh, restrictions. These sound like best practices. Are you satisfied, are all of you satisfied with the handling of data privacy issues regarding medical information in China, CK? Mm -hmm. I think the key thing is that um, 
uh, AI industry in general, the business model itself is not built on reselling the data, but it's actually after you actually get past the training phase, AI is just like any other software. You don't actually need the data to be commercialized for the next phase. So I think the, the whole thing is that uh, moving forward, we, we might be looking for a way in which we can actually train the data, but after uh, train the model using the anonymized, desensitized data, and after that, the AI is just like any other software in which we deploy it, and maybe we'll fix it, make it better in the process, but then we actually don't need the raw data in the, in, in, at the end. So I think this is going to be, like, I think this is going to be the final way in which we use data in AI, but I think it's going to take time to for the entire system to mature. Yeah. Nisa? So um, about a year ago, the uh, Minister of Health, Ministry of Health actually set up the um, Medical um, Patient Data um, Privacy Commission and uh, to address uh, policies in this area. So I think you know, right now, uh, the government is going through uh, the different policy suggestions and whatnot in this particular area. And one thing you also have to bear in mind is uh, about 90% of the patient uh, flow actually goes to public hospitals. Um, so the public hospitals are very guarded with the um, patient data that they, they have. And they would actually not, prefer, not, not even share within one city or you know, outside of their hospital. So I think that's something else that we believe um, will be you know, how the data, uh, patient data uh, flow within the system uh, will actually be regulated by the government. You know. Well, thank you. Um, many questions have come in. We can't, regrettably, because of time, address them all. But what's on everybody's mind is, how is medical education in China equipping physicians for the future? Are physicians in China um, not starting as many AI-related companies as in the United States? Curiosities about how the Chinese medical and scientific education system may be more advanced in preparing biologists and clinicians for a digital future, um, and cu great curiosity about interoperability of the EHR systems within China, um, and surely many more. Um, as we're closing the session, Nisa, I wonder if we could start with you and then come down. Um, challenges are opportunities. Uh, what do you identify, in just a few words each, please, as the greatest challenges slash opportunities in AI healthcare in China? Well, I think the first one that comes to mind is the US-China trade issue when it comes to AI um, development um, in China and in US. And I think it's, um, it's a challenge, but it's also an opportunity where countries, each country themselves can think about what are the areas, the entrepreneurs within the countries, what areas they really want to focus on and really build the R&D and the capability of. And I think one thing that we see in China is the uh, ability to ramp up data very, very quickly. And that's why we're seeing a lot of US companies want to come here, uh, go to China. But at the same time, we're also seeing a lot of technology being generated in US. So how does, how does one work together and collaborate uh, given the political environment? Yeah. Thank you. Roger? Uh, I think it's, uh, the opportunity and the, and the challenges, I think, is the value of uh, our AI. And we do find it, you know, uh, the, the technology that we have developed on our platform to be quite powerful. And, uh, and uh, so, you know, the core, the core value and the humanity uh, that we, we want this uh, technology to have, it, it will be, a, will be a, something that we would like to discuss and uh, learn over time. Uh, I think the opportunity and the challenge is uh, CFDA clearance. Uh, last year, IDXDR got FDA clearance. And uh, right now, China has no uh, standard procedure for CFDA clearance. So I think maybe uh, we can learn a lot from FDA. I'm one of the members in the board of CFDA, so uh, I think we can learn a lot from U.S. and uh, to make the procedure more standard. Thank you. CK. Yeah, so actually one of the challenges and opportunities, and also answering to one of the questions, I think is talent, uh, cross-field talent in which, like for example, I, I, I came from AI, 
world, and I can actually talk to, uh, I can understand and also talk to people from medicine. In, if I actually come from the medical world, I can actually understand AI and actually perform like AI feats. So, so I think the challenge really is to develop the talent pool that can face the next generation of digitized medicines, which actually require people to understand like the language of both worlds, which is actually pretty hard. Like then just like to say, say it like that. No. Thank you. I'm going to use CK's Valley and, and Peak model. <laughs> so I think on the Valley is, is I would share the regulatory environment and the, and the maturation of that and the trust created around that. I think that's, that's the, 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 the challenging part. I think on the top part, it's a, I think China will set the standard for affordable virtual health care in a way that we haven't seen any other part of the world. And I think that'll benefit not only China, but many other parts as well. Well, thank you. And I would just add quality at scale. Um, there's great inequity in healthcare in the United States, um, Europe, and, and also, and perhaps especially in China. Um, healthcare spend in the US at $9,600 per person, in China just about 400. Some of these technologies are very expensive. <laughs> and to scale and provide access to them at scale will be a challenge, and surely the automation of AI can only help. Um, thank you again to the organizers, and please join me in thanking our panelists.